Bingham, and I report on climate change and the real way in which it will affect the world we live in and will change our lives. I have a website called Climate Outcome, which has a lot of the background science to climate change, but it is a big subject with a lot of science. And so in this presentation, we will just be looking at the outcomes. The climate is changing. And although the world's temperature has only increased by just under one degree centigrade, the planet is extremely sensitive. We have put a massive pulse of CO2 into the atmosphere, so that at 400 parts per million, we have created an atmosphere that the planet last had 4 million years ago. The high level of CO2 in that era produced a world where the climate was 2 to 3 degrees centigrade warmer, and as a consequence, the sea level was 25 metres higher. Most of the real action in climate change is taking place in the oceans, unobserved by us. And when we speak of global warming, we should really call it ocean warming. The oceans absorb 93% of the heat that comes from the sun, and the oceans also absorb 50% of the CO2 we have emitted. This is all happening in an area where we have very poor long-term records, or in the case of the deep oceans, any records at all. I use this chart of the ocean conveyor because it shows the turnover points between the warm surface water and the cold, deeper parts of the oceans. As warm water in the Gulf Stream moves north, it cools and sucks CO2 from the atmosphere in vast quantities. And when it sinks, it takes the CO2 into the deep. The chart shows the turnover points in the Southern Ocean, where the cold nutrient and CO2 laden deep water resurfaces after approximately 30 years. I'm not sure that anyone knows precisely how long it takes for water that sinks in the North Atlantic to resurface in the Southern Ocean, but 30 years is a commonly used figure. Although the water is relatively cold, it is still storing heat in the ocean's depths, but it is so dark and deep and has incredible pressure that it is difficult to access it, and that is why there are virtually no long-term records. We have three rovers on the surface of Mars and none in the deep oceans. The abnormal heat and ocean acidity is doing untold damage to a very sensitive system and storing up problems for us when the water resurfaces 30 or 40 years later. These are the indicators that show what is happening in the upper layers of the oceans. In the top chart, the red graph is called the Keeling Curve and shows the increase of CO2 in the atmosphere since 1958. In the blue graph, you can see the corresponding increase in CO2 content in the oceans. And the green chart is the pH level, indicating changes in ocean acidity. The downward slope of the green line indicates that the sea is becoming more acidic. In the lower illustration, phytoplanktons absorb CO2 for their structures and create oxygen for us to live on in vast quantities. These little chaps provide half of the oxygen that we breathe. Many types of plankton have calcium carbonate structures and calcium reacts with acids and will slowly dissolve. As the structures of the plankton corrode, not only do they die, but their shells release carbon dioxide so that instead of storing carbon on the sea floor, it is released again into the environment. Between 1751 and 1994, ocean surface pH is estimated to have increased in acidity by, al by almost 30%. All ocean creatures with a cal calcium carbonate structure will be de devastated as the oceans become more acidic and reproduction rates of almost all aquatic creatures will suffer. The base of the marine food chain is plankton and these are consumed by krill. If we lose the krill, the whole food chain of the oceans is cut off at the base and we will be in big trouble. As the oceans absorb the CO2, they become more acidic, which damages all aquatic life with calcium carbonate structures, such as corals, mussels, and crayfish. Changes in ocean acidity and temperature are already impacting mussel farms on the US Pacific coast, Brittany in France, and New Zealand. 
Many areas of coral are dying due to a combination of ocean acidity and increased temperatures. And as they die, whole ocean breeding grounds will be lost. Seawater does not have the daily temperature variations that the atmosphere does. And so fish and other aquatic life are much more sensitive to temperature changes than we are. Changes in the ocean temperatures are already causing fish to move, primarily away from recently warm areas into regions with temperatures that, are more, that they are more accustomed to. In general, away from the equator and moving both north and south, follow, following the cooler waters. Whether the food that they will need will move as well is a different matter. As the world warms, the ocean water expands, and although water has a heat expansion coefficient of only 0.000069 per degree centigrade, but with the sea being 3,000 metres deep, we are looking at 300 to 400 millimetres of sea level rise this century alone due to thermal expansion. The major contributor to sea level rise is melting ice, and this has already started to make an impact. Melting ice can be expected to raise sea levels around 2, two metres this century. One meter is the critical indicator for sea level rise, as the 11 of the world's 15 largest cities are only one meter above sea level. We have a tendency to build cities close to the sea and very often on reclaimed marshland. Greenland sits between 60 and 80 degrees latitude north, and so it is not at the North Pole, and it is very susceptible to warming. The ice on the surface is melting in the summer, and the meltwater forms pools which cut a hole in the base of the lake and then the warm water plunges into the deep ice. The water can either lift the glacier so that it can slip towards the sea or it stays deep in the interior to warm the ice. The end result is that this three kilometer thick ice sheet is becoming full of holes and the danger is that it is becoming rotten in its core and may collapse very quickly. The worry here is that scientists can calculate how long it takes to melt a block, a big block of ice, but there is no way of forecasting a sudden collapse of this nature. West Antarctica is very different in that it is a series of islands holding massive amounts of ice together and is very susceptible to warm water melting the ice from below. This melting is eventually causing a collapse of the ice shelf and a dramatic speed up of the huge land-based glaciers that are currently in, being held back by the ice shelves. The Larsen ice shelves A and B have disintegrated, and although Larsen C is still stable, it has to be suspect. The Pine Island and Thwaites glaciers are in the early stages of terminal decline and are being carefully monitored. Nobody knew that the Larsen was going to collapse, Nobody knows how long it will be before the next major collapse will take place. But it will be a lot sooner than we thought 10 years ago. As the ice melts, we have to consider the consequences of rising sea levels. Once you see the infrastructure and farmland that disappears with just one metre of sea level rise, you do not need to look at larger sea level rises of 20 metres or so commonly featured in the media. Big areas of the UK, Holland, and the United States coastline from New York to Florida and then on to New Orleans will be flooded and the econo economic consequences will be huge. On the west coast of the Pacific, from Beijing to Indonesia and on into the Indian Ocean to Bangladesh, many tens of millions of people will be displaced and looking for a new home. The lower map shows the potential loss of massive amounts of farmland in California right up to Sacramento, and this is a fairly typical scenario repeated right around the world. Methane is a very powerful greenhouse gas and is 70 times more powerful than CO2 of over 20 years, and its proportion of the atmosphere has grown by 150% compared to CO2, which has grown by 40%. There is a massive amount of methane locked up in frozen vegetable matter in Siberia and Canada, which is slowly warming and releasing methane into the atmosphere. 
Methane is also held on the seabed, stored like ice by a combination of pressure and cold water. But as the water warms, this is being released and is bubbling to the surface. Just to emphasize methane's importance as a greenhouse gas, it has been calculated that in a previous warming era, when the world's temperatures increased by 10 degrees centigrade, there was not enough CO2 available to raise the temperature more than 5 degrees centigrade. And it must have been bolted by methane to reach the 10 degrees centigrade rise. This is the United States Academy of Scientists forecast for food production in a warming world. As the temperature goes up, food production goes down. There are a variety of reasons, but flood and drought are the main problems. The forecast is for wet areas to get wetter and, dry, and the dry areas to get drier. But just as important in, to farmers, there is expected to be a big increase in crop pests and disease. Th this is much the same information from Europe. The map at the top is by the Institute for Environment and Sustainability, which is the European Union Food Production Authority, and the table at the bottom is by the World Bank. Both give essentially the same figures. The map shows a 25-15% to 15 drop for Spain, France and the other Mediterranean countries, and while there are some gains in the north, it is not enough to offset the losses. As the temperature rises, food production falls, roughly at the rate of 6% for every 1 degree rise in temperature. The forecast is the same for almost every country in the world. As the temperature goes up, food production goes down, and rising sea levels will flood farmland and drinking water supplies with salt water. The last time the world had today's level of 400 parts per million of CO2 was 4 million years ago, and the trees and plants at that time were adapted to the climate that went with it. Those trees had taken thousands of years to evolve to match those conditions. The trees we have today are adapted to a CO2 level of 280 parts per million and a climate almost a degree cooler than it is today and are rapidly going into conditions 2 degrees centigrade warmer and with dramatically changed rainfall conditions of either drought or flood. All around the world, species of trees are dying. What seems to be happening is that the trees become stressed by drought or heat, and in its weakened state, it is overcome by pathogens, which could be a beetle or fungus. If the tree was in good health, it could survive this attack. We can expect to see much larger numbers of trees and other plant life dying in the coming years as the temperature steadily increases. There is a lot of misinformation in climate change, and so for reliable information, I go to government websites. In the USA, I use NASA, who operate sat satellites, NOAA, who monitor the environment and the weather, and the EPA, who protect the water and atmosphere for the people. In the UK, the Met Office report on weather and climate change. In Australia, there is CIRO, who look after the environment, and in New Zealand, we have NIWA, who monitor the environment. All these organisations have excellent scientists and work closely with the universities. Thank you for watching my presentation, and I hope that I have given you food for thought. If you want more details on any sub subject I have covered today, please go to my website, climateoutcome.kiwi.nz. Thank you.